is have some questions and answers now. And we're going to pin the video onto my screen so that nobody can see you. So that gives you some privacy. So if you want to ask the question personally, your voice will be heard. I hope that won't put you off because your voice will be anonymous. And many, most of the people listening to this afterwards will be our friends, they won't be strangers. Um, so if you would be, if you would like to ask a question personally, that would be great. If not, you can ask it in the box. Oh, lovely comments coming. So, uh, and this can be really about anything. So please don't feel it has to be a technical question about deep aspects of the Dhamma, it doesn't, you know, it's just a sharing. If you do have um, anything you'd like to contribute about the talk or about any other subject, please feel free. And uh, I should add that the most easy way for our hosts, I think, is if you go to the participants button and raise your hand. I can see that Alona's done that already. Um, and there may be other people who haven't asked. So maybe Rosa Linda is there. There's a few of you there. So I'll leave it to my hosts to unmute you. Hi, Venerable. I think Hi, Alona. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for a wonderful talk and uh, ceremony. And uh, it's a, uh, you know, I've been once uh, at a time on the street, but nobody they speak English or Swedish. So I didn't know what they're doing. I was part of it. But uh, today, like, I got to know what what does robe mean and what is it offering means. And it's just so wonderful to be part of. Thank you for doing oh, it. Great. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I was, you know, wondering about this. Um, it's a certain meditation and the Buddhist qualities. I was wondering what's the name of it? And uh, because I do guided uh, meditations from YouTube or so I can maybe Google it to follow it because- Yes. Yeah, I, I, um, I've heard some um, mentioned before name, but I don't remember if you- Okay, you yeah, yeah. Say something about it, thank sure. you. Sure. So the name in Pali is um, Buddhanu Sati. Re recollection of the Buddha's qualities or recollection of the Buddha. And uh, I had planned to talk about that. I planned to go through all the different qualities of the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, but I didn't go through any of them. So um, we start off by just bringing to mind who the Buddha was. Um, and the first word there is um, it, uh, Bhagawa. Yeah, this means the blessed one. Uh, uh, arahat means the fully enlightened one, the perfectly enlightened one. So we did talk today about how the Buddha is the one who's overcome all the defilements of the mind. And I, I used Bhikkhu Bodhi's explanation of he's overcome them complete, totally, first of all. That means all of them. He's overcome them completely. That means he's taken out the cause and he's overcome them finally, which means they can never arise again. So reflections like this are, are reflections on the Buddha. But another one that I like to do is um, taught to me by Ajahn Brown. And he gives this meditation using, usually on Vesak, where you actually imagine that you have these qualities of the Buddha, that your heart is fully free, fully at peace, fully contented, and that there's nothing more to be done. So there's this beautiful phrase in, um, in some of the suttas which says, done is what had to be done. There is no more becoming, or there's no more coming to any state of existence for me. Done is what had to be done. Katam karaniyam. And I think this is just such a beautiful summation of what it means to be free. You've done whatever you had to do. You've cultivated the qualities to the maximum. You've completely purified the mind to the point where you can never come back. You know, there's no reason to come back to this samsaric existence anymore. You know, you don't have any more business here. You don't have any more cravings to satisfy. You're fully at peace. And so this is another way you can practice Buddha Sati, actually getting in contact internally with what it would feel like to really have put everything down, to really have no more work to do ever again and to just enjoy the contentment and the peace within yourself. Again, it gives perspective. 
things can arise and pass. The thoughts, the feelings will still come, but they're not yours. You don't own them. You don't make them your problem. You just understand this is nature doing its thing. So these are all different ways that we can contact those qualities of the Buddha. And um, it's a nice question because it might be something I can do one evening as well to do some recollection of the Buddha. Um, we can also do recollection of the Dhamma and the Sangha too. And while we're on that subject, I'd just like to encourage everybody to do another recollection, which is called Chaganusati, which means recollecting on one's own good qualities. So recollecting on one's own virtue, one's own generosity. Yeah, it doesn't have to be anything big. You don't have to have been busy for the last few months looking for the robe and putting the robe together to offer today. This is big good karma, but you've also contributed. Yeah, you've also, I don't know, like looked after somebody who you live with. You've also taken some time to practice meditation. You've spoken kindly with somebody just, just passing you by in the street. All these things you need to rejoice, celebrate, bring them up in your mind because it encourages you to do them again. Yeah. So this is also a really beautiful practice we can do. Good. Thank you for that, Alona. And uh, yeah, shall we go to Rosalinda? Um, Hi. Hey, so um, first of all, I really wanted to thank you for this uh, beautiful talk. It was really nice. I enjoyed it and it was helpful, of course. And yeah, I had uh, two questions. So one was about uh, uh, how, do, how to deal with parents who have wrong, no, they have the wrong view of Buddhism because of a book. And specifically the book is called uh, uh, let me remember. Doctor from El, El Taha, I think. It was by Lobsang Rampa. And yeah, he was, uh -huh. I think, yeah. And yeah, I just want to know about that, how to deal with that. Okay, so yeah. I understood that you wanted to know about how to deal with parents who have the wrong understanding of Buddhism. Yeah. Is, that, is that right? Yeah. So they have some sort of understanding, but they may be being misguided in a way that is clear to you, but maybe mm -hmm. not to them. And um, perhaps you have to listen to them talk about it and you disagree mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and that kind of thing. So um, it's difficult. And I mean, a lot of parents, most of the time, I think, with non-traditional Buddhists, people that are not born into Buddhist families, we have the other problem that we want them to know something about Buddhism, but they don't really want to know anything. <laughs> so um, at least, you know, at least they're a little bit open to hearing the Buddha's teachings. Perhaps they haven't... Um, yeah read the right books just yet but um, yeah. I would do it in a way that is very um, gentle and encouraging rather than critical or concerned and just trust that they are looking for something that perhaps you're a few steps further on the path at this time which is often the case for for, for children actually I often think that each generation is in a way starting a little bit ahead or is going to you know continue to go a little bit further than the last generation so i would say that the main way you can instill that faith and understanding in your parents is just to practice properly practice what you understand and apply it you know practice it in the way you speak to them in the way you talk to them in your gentleness your patience your your um your trust that they do have the right intention and that little by little they may come into contact with with um good teachings i mean other little things you can do which is uh <laughs> sort of what ajahn brown will probably say is leave out a book by accident <laughs> somewhere near them and you can always leave a nice story book from ajahn brown i actually gave um, my parents one i just put one in their room because uh, they're a little bit open now to the teachings for sure um, but they don't normally have time to read uh, Dhamma books. They usually read the newspapers. So I just put one in my dad's room and uh, sort of suggested that he might read it later that night. And then the next morning I gave it to my mom while we were both getting ready for something else. And, uh, and she actually said to me before she left, do you have a spare copy of the book that I could take with me? And I was like, oh yes, definitely. <laughs> it's yours, you know? <laughs> Um, and that was just by leaving it out <laughs> somewhere strategic. So this is one thing you can do. 
So I would say don't worry too much, just focus on your practice and show that you're committed, show that you, you know, if you meditate every day, even just for a few minutes, that can be leading by example. Even if you don't have long, you can just say to them, well, mom and dad, you know, I'm just going to meditate now for some time. I'm going to close the door and be quiet. So I'll see you in a bit. Yeah. Even if it's just for five minutes and bit by bit, they'll start to see the changes in you and this will make them interested. People have to start somewhere um, and it isn't easy to get in contact with the good teachings. But um, yeah, watch a few Ajahn Brahm videos while they're around. And see if they can get attracted to this the terrible jokes. <laughs> okay, good luck with that. Just just try to be patient and trust that, you know, that they're, they're looking in the right direction, so they will find the Dhamma. Great, I'll take one more question and then uh, if we have, oh, do we have more than one question? Yeah, I'll take one more question and then we'll have some little groups. So, Hi. 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 Uh, thank you for the really insightful talk. Uh, it meant a lot for me. Um, so I would like to ask a question for my mom. Uh, so she's been meditating for the last two months or so, uh, but she's kind of a control freak. Uh, she, she always tries to control her mind. Like um, she gets distracted quite often. So she tries to control herself a lot. Uh, so for that reason, she isn't noticing any like um, progress in meditation. So I would like to ask uh, some advice for her. Okay, good, yeah. Um, again, it depends how receptive your mom's going to be to advice from you, because sometimes parents feel a little bit proud to take advice from their children. Sometimes they want to feel that you trust them and that they know best. <laughs> so I don't know if that's the case for your mom or not, but if she is receptive to you, what I would try to do is um, probably just remind her that meditation is a break from the usual way of the world. And that, you know, throughout the day, she's busy doing things for everybody else. She's busy trying to get it right, trying to be a good person, you know, trying so hard in every single way. And that meditation is really a break for her. You know, it's really a vacation from all of that, from all the measuring, from all the controlling. It's just time where she's alone inside herself and no one knows what's happening in her mind. So it really doesn't matter, you know. I've been meditating a long time and my teacher doesn't have any expectations of me. He told me the other day, because I told him that I'm struggling to find enough time to practice at the moment, you know, as much time as I would like. And he said, don't worry, you know, just go and sit down. And no matter what your mind does, just relax. He said, it, it might go to sleep. It might be thinking all over the place. It doesn't matter, you know, just, just accept it. And I think this is so wonderful to know and to trust that you can just accept it. Even if you've been meditating for 24 years, you know, like I have, sometimes that's what the mind has to do. And that's perfectly fine. It can actually be a, re a relief to just allow it to be. You know, this is where we get some rest for once. So I would also um, encourage your mom to just focus more, not on the content of her mind, but on how she's relating to it. You know, is she struggling with it? Is she wishing it was different? Or can she make peace and just relax and be present with whatever arises? Yeah. So I don't know if that really helps because that's all about perhaps what you might be able to advise her to do. Um, another thing that you could do is just try to encourage her by telling her that she is doing well and that she is getting benefit whether she knows it or not. Another skillful method sometimes can be to just um, encourage your mom to look at her mind at the end of the meditation compared to her mind when she began the meditation and she'll probably find that there is a change even a slight change yeah and then to also ask her to notice what brought that change about? Was it because you did something, you tried, you controlled, or was it just because you managed to relax a little bit and let go? So there's some suggestions. I mean, another thing that perhaps you could do is um, encourage her to maybe listen to a guided meditation with you, sit down together, put on the talk or the guided meditation of a teacher like Ajahn Brahm. 
you know, where he is saying, don't measure, let go, relax. It's quite normal to be a control freak. We all are control freaks. And especially in the beginning, you know, as beginners, we feel more worried about what's going to happen. We feel like we have to do something to make it work. Something might go wrong. But over time, when we gain a bit of confidence, that controlling lessens and we start to enjoy the meditation a little bit more. So try to encourage your mom and tell her not to look too hard for results. Every time you sit down to meditate, you're putting that drop in the jar. Yeah. So I hope there's something in there that can be of help. And again, you know, as it's not only that parents, you know, have a certain um, emotional closeness and attachment to their children, but we also have an emotional closeness and an attachment to our parents. So sometimes we're a little bit more concerned for them than we need to be over concerned, right? Because they're our parents. So she might be doing better than she thinks, and she might not be quite as controlling as it seems. So just, just give her that trust and give her some encouragement. Okay, great. So we've got some minutes left and I wanted to give you all the opportunity and I really don't want you to run away. <laughs> I see some of you have run away. Um, to just meet in small groups and there's not going to be any um, difficult question to answer, but I'd like to um, put you into little groups. And what's going to happen is that I'll give you some kind of, um, uh, I, I get the message, Amory. I'm gonna have to just change the settings, but first I'll just, um, I'll just explain it. So basically, we, um, I'd like to encourage you just to share a little bit of anything that comes to mind. It might be to do with refuge and what refuge means to you. It might be to do with what you're struggling with at the moment, or maybe something that's inspired you. And there's going to be three in each room. And basically each of you will get to talk for about two minutes and everyone else in the group will just give a loving presence. They'll be just there to listen and receive. And as the next person shares, you will also just listen and receive that person, whatever they want to say. And please don't feel that you need to perform or come up with anything special. This is just a very intimate and, and very nourishing um, experience for almost everybody, actually everybody, whoever gives it a go. Just to feel that you can, you know, be with other people who are just there to listen uh, and to listen with kindly ears. Okay, so we're going to do that. So each group will be about three people and will last for about six minutes. So that's about two minutes each. I think there's a way that the host can um, can give you a little reminder every two minutes or something that it's time for the next person to speak. So. Hey, most of you are still with us. 27. <laughs> 27 only. <laughs> hey, hey, Karen and Anna are together. Oh, hi, I thought you were separate. How lovely to see you both. Oh, you were separate. Have you gone around to see each other? Oh, a different computer. <laughs> Great. So most of you are still with us. A few less numbers, but I'd be curious to hear how that was for people. If anyone would like to, uh, to comment, you can put a little comment in the box or you can uh, raise your hand if you wish. Um, just one or two, and then we'll just end up the day with a few closing words. Oh, delightful, wonderful, amazing. <laughs> You're all such positive people. Thank you to the group. Enjoyed it. Happy to talk with these people. Oh, it can be very connecting. Connected to the Anacampa family. Great idea. Yeah. Great. If I wasn't losing so many people, we might do this more often. But bit by bit, if I get a group of you who give it a go, we'll all be converted. A great experience. Hesitant as I was unsure what to say, but a good experience. Yeah, great. 
I'm glad that you appreciated the gentle push. <laughs> Sometimes it's uh, very, re very rewarding to go against the grain and to just meet those edges of resistance within ourselves. Imagine how many I had to meet, somebody who would never, even at school, spoken in public, having to give Dhamma talks. You know, having to teach the Dhamma, which is something that I don't feel, first of all, qualified really for, or at least not as qualified as I'd like to be, and also something so precious and noble and lofty. You don't want to make any mistakes. So it's been a really steep learning curve, and I, I do really appreciate, you know, how it feels to be kind of put on the edge like that. So well done, everybody. Next time, I'll ask you to do the Dhamma talk. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Training you up. Having said which, I did ask um, Anne-Marie to say a few words as well about um, continuing to support us. And, um, and then when she's done that, I uh, agree you should continue the group chats. That's good. I'm glad you've all had a good experience. So I'll go over to Anne-Marie to say a few words and then we'll have a few closing words to end the day. Please don't go because I really do want to hear everybody with their big sadhus and their beautiful goodbyes at the end, okay? <laughs> Excellent. So over to Amory. Thank you. Venerable was trying to unmute me whilst I was trying to do the same thing, so it took a while. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you so much, Venerable, for such a special day, I think, for all of us. Um, and also to Ayana Nabodi, who's, who's no longer here, but was with us very early, all the way from California this morning. And a really, really special thank you to Tahani for organising this and for... Um, for letting us share in the blessings of offering the rope. And I think also a real education for me anyway, and I think for some other people here today as well. So, so that was really nice. Um, so um, for those of you um, who would uh, like to support Venerable or the project, I would just like to offer a couple of ways um, of doing that. Um, so uh, first of all, um, there is a, uh, a page on the website and I'm going to put all of this information in the chat box in a, in a minute. Um, there's a page on the website with information on how to uh, offer monetary donations and all donations um, go towards the running cost of the uh, Oxford residence um, where Venerable is at the moment and also contribute towards the, um, the, the purchase and the development of the first Bikuni monastery in the UK. Um, and then also another special way of supporting um, Venerable uh, at this time is um, through uh, offering some shopping or some other requisites because, because of the COVID restrictions, Venerable can't uh, receive any guests at the moment. So, um, so yeah, if, if anybody would like to help with, could be some online shopping um, or there's also a needed item li items list on the website. Let me just put all that information for you. Oh, in a, in a minute, I had something else copy and pasted. <laughs> um, so for those who are listening to the live stream, I'll just mention um, the donation information is on the website, which is anukampaproject.org forward slash donate. And if you would like to help out with the food offerings or other requisites or um, offer anything on the needed item li items list, which is also on the website, you can email the team and that's team at anukampaproject.org. So I'll hand it back to Venerable and then I'll find whatever I wanted to put in the chat box for you so you can read it. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. I think it's so lovely when several people speak, actually. It really gives me a sense that this community is real, <laughs> you know, surprisingly so, considering that, yeah, people haven't been able to come and visit here for so long. And yet, you know, I think we've spread and reached more people than I could have ever dreamed of reaching. Today, we've had people from Latvia, from New York, from California, um, and you've all, yeah, been here 
for the pretty much for the duration. I'm not sure where Satira is calling in from. Um, are you in England, Satira, or are you somewhere I'm else? I'm from the United Arab Emirates. Ah, pretty... you're the one who's from the United yeah. Arab Emirates. That is so awesome. And there was also someone here from Malaysia. Um, I know Rennie's here from Norway. So it's just incredible and it really is a source of joy. So I'm leaving today feeling incredibly uplifted. Um, what I thought, you know, <laughs> part of the mind is always, you know, the kind of part which inclines somehow more to the world. And, uh, you know, I was saying to one of the co-hosts today, she was saying, are you excited? I said, well, yeah, but I, it's also like not quite the same for me, right? Because it, I'm, I'm having to produce something is a little bit daunting sometimes right but actually it's so beautiful you know when you can let go of that sense of self and let go of that sense of like having to perform or you know is it going to be a good talk how do I feel I came to this meeting feeling really quite exhausted um you know the last few weeks have been quite um busy going from you know, doing like 10 hours of meditation and that's just on my cushion, right? But the whole day really in a very, very meditative state to more than that amount of time on the computer, organizing retreats and newsletters. So I arrived feeling tired, but you know, the Dhamma is really incredible because as soon as you start to tap into the meaning and the purpose of what we're doing, like I was saying, this eudaimonic happiness, right? Not the happiness based on pleasant sensations, pleasant feelings, but the happiness based on a sense of meaning that starts to come through and it actually does change the felt experience of body and mind. So right now, as you can tell from my voice, I'm actually full of energy, feeling really inspired, really happy and uplifted. And um, what a show of support, you know, what a show of support. And this is all as a result of having practiced here for the last three months. I think, you know, the fact that that um, is appreciated in this world, that we can actually celebrate silence, we can celebrate solitude, we can celebrate aloneness going within. This is really wonderful. Yeah, really, really wonderful. And to have that balanced with the contributing, with the serving community, this is really the path. And this is the essence of what we're trying to do with the monastery. It's going to be a place for you to practice and serve. So the two are going to be so well integrated, you know, that all these factors of the noble path are going to come to fulfillment and support each other. So this is the difference really between a monastery and a meditation center. A meditation center, you go, you do your practice, you leave. In a good place, you may also get the chance to serve. But in a monastery, it becomes more integrated into everyday life. And hopefully the community is a bit more stable too. You know, there are residents there, there are people who stay, who are committed for the long term. And over time you can gain those relationships, not only with me, but also with each other. Yeah. So this is a wonderful thing to be part of and I'm very, very happy to know all of you. Um, one of our group, John, who's been coming to the morning meta meditations, he actually arrived at my door just before this meeting started. Um, because he's doing a, a, a sponsored cycle ride from, I think, Reading to Oxford um, for the charity Global Buddhist Relief. If anybody would like to do some, um, you know, promote them or do some fundraising on their Facebook page for them, you can just do a little Facebook fundraiser. You don't actually have to do anything. You just literally put it on your page. They do a lot of absolutely wonderful work by bringing... Um, um, I guess monetary support and I'm not sure if I guess that they transform that into like you know items like books or clothes or water fresh water and I know they're doing work with women in prison in Cambodia some of them are imprisoned with their children um, and these kind of things and that project is run by the venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi who's translated all of the Pali texts so um, John just turned up at my door this was my point um, and for the first time we had an interaction, you know, until then he'd just been, like many of you, a person on the screen. <laughs> and suddenly he was there at my door saying that in the future he'd like to come and cook at the monastery. So this is, it's really magical <laughs> that somehow, 
you know, there is this community out there and I'm sure that one day we will all be in one place together, perhaps at different times. And until then, we will be meeting each other again and again for these sessions. So I look forward to next time. Next time is Wednesday for the chanting session at 5.30. And after that, it'll be a, a, a Dhamma talk on Sunday evening. And then on the 7th of November, which I think is the following week, we have a, a long Q&A session with Ajahn Brahm. So that's going to be very special. Part two of hard questions to a soft teacher on the 7th of November. So all of this stuff is found on our website, anukampaproject.org slash events. And I hope to see you somewhere soon. In the meantime, please continue to take refuge in the right places, wherever those places are for you. Thank you so much. Lots and lots of metta. I can see lots of people's mouths moving, but we're going to unmute you now so that we can actually say goodbye. <laughs>